Our guest today is uh, Zen Master Bun Young, Jane Dobiz of the Cambridge Zen Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, she's a teacher at the Kwanon School of Zen. So welcome, uh, Zen Master Bun Young. Well, thank you very much for, for having me, Adam. Absolutely. Um, so the first question I always ask people is just, uh, how did they get? In, how did you get involved with Zen practice? I see that you got, uh, you came sort of through the Tibetan and Vipassana traditions, but um, looks like you met uh, Zen Master Sun San in 1982 or so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think the way I got involved, I was raised Catholic, and so I was always I was in Catholic school growing up. And then around the age of 14 or 15 or so, I started feeling like I was just going through the motions, you know, please stand, please sit, please repeat, please say this, please say that. And I wasn't really getting anything out of it um, at that time, although I think I had gotten a lot more out of it than I really was aware of. You know, I learned a lot from it, from the tradition. Um, but I felt like in terms of um, me being able to access what it was I was after, I wasn't getting that. So I stopped going to church um, around that time, uh, and I had that big question inside that I think we all we all do have, which is, you know, you can put it a million ways, but the heart of it is, you know, what is what is this, or what am I, or what is life, what is death, and um, so that's what I was really after, and I just I didn't know there were tools of any kind that you could you could actually access that point for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I'd ask myself these questions and then I would just um, invariably abandon pursuing it because it was so big I didn't have a doorway into how I could address that. So I started reading books and each book had a different, you know, different idea. So I started reading different books in psychology and Freud and I was trying to analyze my dreams and doing all this different stuff, and all the different books said different things. So when I was in college, um, at this point I was now, I think, a junior. And I was about 19, 18, 19 years old. Um, I signed up for a, a college class that was called The Psychology of the Zen Experience, and uh, it was taught by Professor Bob Gussner. And the first book that we were given was uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And that was by Suzuki Roshi. And I just randomly opened the book up and it said, if you want to know if tea is hot or cold, you must drink it yourself. And that was, for me, the first true thing I felt that I had ever heard. And so I, I flipped the book over, I looked at his face on the back cover, and I decided I was going to go find out, you know, how I could pursue this this type of teaching and and maybe meet this particular Zen master or maybe, you know, find out who these other people are who also had the same question as I had. Um, so ironically, Zen master Sung Sun was right around the corner from where I grew up in Rhode Island, but of course I didn't know that. Oh, that's fortunate. <laughs> Pardon me? I said that's fortunate. I know, I know, it's really funny, but I didn't know that. So, because at that time, this is a really long time ago, at that time, these teachers that were coming over from Asia, like Mahavosananda and the different Zen masters, um, Zen Master Sung San, uh, Vipassana teachers, like the second generation, like Joseph Goldstein and, and Jack Cornfield and all those people, that was kind of still really new. We didn't have the internet yet. It wasn't easy to find this if you weren't already familiar with it. So, um, so I thought you had to go to Asia. I thought you had to go to the Himalayans because that's what I had read. So I did that. And um, I went to Nepal, um, lived with a Nepali family, enrolled in a, um, a school for international training, did this program abroad over there with the purpose of trying to meet Tibetan Buddhists. Of course, they weren't Zen, they weren't Zen teachers like I had originally seen in the book uh, with Suzuki Roshi, but I didn't really know there was a difference between any of these different traditions at that time. So, you know, I climbed to the top of one of these mountains um, with some friends and, and we started, you know, looking for the Lama and the Lama, it turned out, was in New York. <coughs> so, that's like a story that a lot of people who have, you know, been 
practicing with me for for a long time have already heard um, but it was just so ironic that you you know go all the way around the world and you climb to the top of a tall peak and sure enough the llama's in new york and <laughs> even furthermore so the teacher i ended up with was in rhode island which is my hometown so that's how I got involved in the Tibetan part of the practice. Um, I did finally eventually meet some really amazing Tibetan teachers there, and I practiced with them. Um, and then when I came back to the United States and California for a couple of years, I practiced with them for a couple of years. Um, but I couldn't, again, I couldn't, I loved them, and I could see that it was working for them, but I could not do those forms. Mm. For whatever reason, when I would sit down to try to do the visualizations and all this stuff, I couldn't see the pictures mm. that I was supposed to try to see. I just wasn't, like, getting in there. You know, I needed something more basic. Mm-hmm. So, so I ended up one day um, getting really upset. I was with, um, I think it was Geshe Jelton, and who's, I think, since passed away, and Gonsa Rinpoche and His Holiness Tong Rinpoche, and we were on this retreat in Joshua Tree, and it was a, I think it was a couple, couple weeks long retreat or maybe a 10 day retreat. I just could not do the practices. Like I, I was getting a headache mostly. Mm-hmm. And so I, I asked for a meeting with them and you know, I was really young, I was really upset. I'm like, I can't do this practice, it's too complicated. Um, and I picked up a Coke bottle, which was in, sitting on the table next to me, and I said, well, why can't we just, you know, use something at hand that's very immediate, like this Coke bottle? And they all three burst out laughing, and it, but really kindly, and they said, if you want to see the Buddha in a Coke bottle, you can see the Buddha in a Coke bottle. And the way they, the way they were so kind about it, at that moment I realized, you know, it's okay if I change traditions. It's all like I don't have to feel guilty about it. I can go with their blessing and try to do something that's more simple for my particular personality. So I ended up um, doing the Vipassana thing and sitting a lot of retreats with Joseph and Jack and then eventually became a long term yogi at um, Insight Meditation Society in Barry. And f- for me, and it's not the same for everybody, but for me, just that ability to just breathe in, breathe out, was something that now I could actually access that. That was something I could do. Okay. And so that's how I ended up um, in the Vipassana tradition, and I, I'm incredibly grateful for all the teaching I got, both in the Tibetan tradition, I stayed in the Vipassana tradition for a number of years. Now, was that closer to when, what you were looking for? Pardon me? Was that closer to what you were looking for? Yeah, it was. I mean, I think for for some people, they could sit down and do those visualizations, and they could maybe access that that thing that we were looking for, which which is that thing that's before words, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like my teacher always says, you know, there's many names for this. You can call it energy. You can call it consciousness. You can call it love. You can call it soul. But those are all just names for this thing, and this thing itself has no name. And so I was much more able to to find a doorway in through the just trying to breathe in, breathe out, and doing the insight meditation than I was able to in the other tradition. Um, just technically speaking, the instructions that they had were really, really helpful and accessible to me. Um, and so... So we ended up, you know, getting an awful lot out of the Tibetan tradition as far as just the Bodhisattva, that they had that Bodhisattva direction piece that was really great. And and then the Vipassana um, teachers were incredible and the, the technical sort of instructions that they gave um, were extremely helpful. And then the ability to sit these very long retreats for... And the longest one I sat there was for six months in silence, and that was very, very powerful wow. at a young age to be able to do that. And How old were you? Let's see. I would have been about 22, okay. 21, 21 or 22, something like that. Hmm. And um, so at the very end of uh, one of these retreats, um, Zen Master Sung Sung came and spoke to this group of people. There were a lot of people at that retreat. There were, you know, maybe 80 or 90 um, 
what do they call them, yogis. Mm -hmm. And um, Joseph Goldstein was there, and Jack Cornfield, and uh, Jacqueline Schwartz was there, who who was also had been a nun at that time, so her name was Kanta Lakati. There was a woman named Sunanda. Um, Nindraji was there. Um, Bhante Sivali. There was a, quite a roster of teachers that were amazing. It was an amazing retreat. Um, so at the end of the first segment of the six months, the end of the first three months, Santamim came, and I had never seen anything like that before. Where he came and he was sort of, you know, asking these questions to everybody in the audience, the Zen Koan style. And that was really the first time I met him, and I thought, well, I really want to go study with this this man. And then that's how that's how he became my teacher. What was it about his uh, character demeanor that kind of that made you decide to do that? Well, we had this really neat exchange where. He kept saying he had this he had a Zen stick and he he kept and he was really funny, which I I, I always liked that. I I mean, so were the Vipassana teachers and actually so were the Tibetan Lamas, all those guys had a really good sense of humor. Um, which I gravitate towards. And um but he was really funny but he was really sharp too, you know? And so he kept saying, I hit you thirty times when people would ask him a question. And they thought, What the heck is that all about? So I raised my hand. I'm like a little afraid of the guy too, you know, like he was kind of daunting. And I raised my hand and I said, well, you keep saying you're, you're going to hit people 30 times. Do you really hit them? So he said, and he had the accent, so it was tough to understand what he was saying. He said, you come in here, you know. So now I, I walk up in front of this whole audience and I sit in front of him and he claps his hands. And he looks at me and he says, take this sound and bring it here. But I couldn't understand what he was saying. The first time he said he was like, tick, 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 tick. You know, I was like, what? So he said, take this sound and bring it here. So without thinking, I just gave, gave him a big high five. And he just burst out laughing. He said, that's wonderful that's a zen mind mm -hmm. and that was kind of this moment where we really clicked and mm -hmm. i i liked the idea of being able to sort of express or use what you get in action and of course i didn't know at that time that that was really koan practice but that was the beginning of you know sort of embarking on on koan practice there was just there was just this connection that we made that I just knew like this guy's gonna be my he's my teacher now and that's awesome. So I became a student. Yeah, it was really a great it was really kind of an amazing um, moment and um, after that I after that I stayed three more months there um, with a couple of people. There was Alfred von Elman who is I think teaching mindfulness in Switzerland perhaps. Okay. And then there was another person, Lottie Sanders, um, who I think at the time later married a guy and changed her last name to Clark, but she she stayed on. And there was one other person, so four of us stayed for three more months. And then when I left there, um, that was that was an amazing six months. You know, you, if you sit for six months time, it's pretty long time and I think most people who would go through something like that are pretty awake when they in a certain respect when they come out and I decided that I would just go and, and start to do you know live at the Providence Sun Center and practice with Sun Master Sun Sun and so then I that was the, the beginning of that okay now uh, you were very you were 22 when you were kind of exploring all this you were in your early 20s um, what did your uh, parents think about all this well, uh, my father had died when I was six years old, so oh, he wasn't okay. there to comment. And that also probably was feeding into, like, this whole big question of life and death and when somebody, you know, where did he go kind of thing and, imperm and getting that impermanence at a very early age. Mm -hmm. And my mother um, was a, a Catholic, a pretty devout Catholic, but she was really open-minded and... I don't know, a very conservative woman, but she let me go and do this, this, these things, you know. So I would go to Nepal and 
um, climb these mountains in the Himalayas and come back. And then th I remember the day she dropped me off, though, at Insight Meditation Society in Barry. She did say to me on the way out, why are you keeping silence? And she said, you know, the Lord gave you a mouth so you can use it. <laughs> that, was the, that was her comment. Mm. Um, but she was always pretty kind of open to me being able to do this sort of thing. And I did many, many of these retreats. And she, you know, she's the one that would pick me up at the end of, she picked me up at the end of my 100-day solo retreat, you know. And she was curious about it. So, so I, I'm thankful for that. Did she, uh, I'm curious, did she notice um, it changing you in any way? I think, I think my advice to young people, too, if they, you know, if, you're, if young people are raised in a, in a strict religious tradition or a more traditional, like a Jewish family, a Catholic family, a Muslim family, and they want to pursue Buddhism, I think one of the things you can do to help your parents um, out, and in turn that would help you out, it would be to not be fanatical about it, but to continue to love your parents and be yourself, you know, be your same self that you always are, that your parents know you, they know you better than anybody. Um, you know how sometimes when people like first become a vegetarian and then they get very militant about it? Oh, yes. And then they're like, oh, I can't believe you're eating meat. And they give you all the slaughterhouse kind of, you know, lectures and everything. And that turns people off. Mm -hmm. Um, but if people notice that you're doing this thing and you're still yourself, but you're, you know, you're still your normal self and you keep your correct situation and relationship and function in terms of your job and your parents and your family and your life and your studies, then they're going to be a lot more inclined to support you in that practice. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. I you know, I think so. I think, yeah, a lot of people get really sort of fanatical about it. If you're sitting in your room and you say, I have to meditate right now, mm -hmm. and your your mother needs you to help put the Thanksgiving dinner on the table, she's not going to like meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to help her put the Thanksgiving dinner on the table and meditate before or afterwards, and, and just let go of your sort of attachment to your own particular need at that moment. And I think that will help will help parents really be, understand what their kids are doing and, you know, just be welcoming but not pushy about it, kind right. of. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, now, <clears throat> what was the practice like within the, the quantum school of Zen in contrast to the other two traditions that you you came through? Yeah, it was, it was funny because the, the um, Vipassana tradition, like on the long retreats, they did have a schedule, but you could do whatever you wanted. So let's say, you know, they'd have sitting, walking, sitting, walking, lunch, and, and this sort of thing, and then sitting, walking, sitting, walking, and then, you know, dinner, and there'd, there'd be a talk or something. If you were walking and you wanted to keep walking, you know, very, very slowly and very, very mindfully, you could do that. So it was, it was sort of an individual within the context of a group, and most people followed the structure of, you know, the the framework of the schedule more or less, but, you know, there was a lot of variation. So your, your motivation was, it was more individual, I think. So even though you're in the group, you're doing your own thing. And if you wanted to stay after lunch and eat very, very slowly to finish your lunch, you could, and that sort of thing. Whereas in the Korean tradition, um, everything is very, like, they, they call it together action. So there is none of that. Like if, if you want to wake up, if wake up's at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning, everybody wakes up. And if you don't wake up, you know, somebody's going to be in your room going, get up and get to the Dharma room. So then when you go to the Dharma room, you do 108 bows. That was something different. Um, they did not do in the Vipassana tradition, although the Tibetans do a lot of prostrations. Um, so you do 108 bows. That's good exercise. It's really good exercise. Yeah. Um, Santanini used to do a thousand bows a day, his, like his whole life. That's a lot of bows. Wow, he must have had really strong legs and hips. He did. He had quads, you know, he had strong legs. And so that's why he was able, I think, too, to... Ha he had so much energy anyway. Just mm -hmm. He just had that. Um, he had that Dharma energy and he had his own, you know, personal energy. But I think it probably kept him really fit, too. Mm -hmm. um, so... 
so then you you know then you have sitting walking sitting chanting and different things like that there, there was chanting a lot more chanting in the korean tradition too uh work period everybody had to chop wood or clean the kitchen or what have you um so you have you have to really go with the group in the korean style um they also weren't it, things were faster in the korean tradition like you when you eat you eat really quickly in the monastery and like temple in korea um the meals are pretty quick in the vipassana tradition people will be chewing very slowly and tasting and swallowing you know and and that sort of thing um and then the koan practice is different where um they have that so there is that emphasis on how how do you experience uh, how do you express whatever it is that you're experiencing on that cushion how are you going to use it how are you going to use it in this situation or that situation with this person with your boss with your you know your coworker with your husband with your child with your wife etc um they didn't have anywhere near as much of an emphasis on silence either so i remember being at some summer retreats and then there would be a break between you know maybe four o'clock and five thirty for dinner and there wasn't as much of an emphasis on on stone cold silence like they had in the vipassana tradition so you know that was that was all sort of different um the other thing that was kind of neat was there are a lot of korean people around and involved so you really get a lot of this korean cultural piece the korean food and the kimchi and the rice cakes and the chanting and the traditions and the paper lanterns and you know that was probably because the something was still alive and he was very patriotic and he had a lot of korean students and friends so he liked he his kimchi kind of, yeah oh well, we all ended up loving kimchi yeah kimchi transmission but um so there was a whole cultural piece that um came with it too that was really uh, fun for me and i think for a lot of us to step into that whole cultural piece and of course we went to korea many times and they sat a 90 day retreat at shinwon sa in korea which was incredible mm-hmm. and that's um that was a great gift too yeah Well, you, you you spoke about how the Korean in the Korean tradition together action is very important, and um, y- do you think that the uh, lessening of a, like a strict observance to silence might have helped to kind of foster a sense of community among you guys? Um, yeah, I guess if I now that you mention it, Adam, I mean there's that whole residential piece that went too with it, like where. Again, this is my experience going back. I don't know what what it's like now, but at that time, there we had residential Zen center. So, so you got the community by living in the Zen center. Whereas I think in the Vipassana tradition, it was more like you would go to the long retreats or the ten day retreats, but then you would go home. Like you weren't living there year round all the time every day. Mm-hmm. Now maybe they have maybe they have more residential places now. I don't know. So I think you got a lot of that community quote together action piece also by living together with like in Cambridge Zen Center and there's like 40 people living there. Wow. Um at any given time so we have a huge building um that picks up, you know, half a city block plus two other apartment buildings um that's full of residents at the Zen Center. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a really interesting thing, you know. Getting along with Tweet is great. It, it's so great and but getting up every single day to practice 365 days a year you know when you first move into a zen center you keep waiting for that day off and it just never comes um because it's every day and every night and but you're doing it in the context of your job and maybe your school work or whatever it is that you you may do so you have this structure of practice that's built into your daily life that's a little bit well it's community based if you're living in a zen center okay one moment i got some people outside of my window and i just want to let them know that i need a little bit more quiet <laughs> so one moment okay okay i'm sorry <laughs> I'll, okay. I'll edit that out. people are doing the gutters um yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that time of year. Yeah, 
Sorry, I got a little distracted there too, so I didn't hear the end of that. Um, um, so you, you mentioned too that, that in uh, the Korean tradition that eating or consuming food is real quick. Do you guys have your own version of sort of uh, orioki? Yes, it's, um, it's a four bowl style. I think orioki might be three. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, I've done a couple of Japanese um, retreats, but it's four bowls. Uh, it's incredibly efficient. It, it wastes nothing. Mm -hmm. It's really a beautiful way to eat a meal. So everybody sits down. Um, again, it, 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 this is the other thing that's really different about Zen and, say, the Vipassana tradition or p perhaps even the Tibetan tradition. When you're sitting, it's all in a row. Mm -hmm. The bowls are all completely lined up. Everything is in its place. You know, the chopsticks are all facing 3 o'clock. Like, it's very, very meticulous. And that emphasis on that being meticulous is also part of the Japanese tradition. And it's about paying attention to every single detail so that everything you do in the course of these retreats or these actions is teaching you to, to pay attention in this moment, including when you're eating. So you, the head Dharma teacher hits the chukbi, it's like a, a stick with a slit up the middle of it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a little clapper. They hit that three times, and the bowls are, are tied up in a cloth, which becomes a placemat. And then you put your bowls um, in a stack, and there's a ritual to it. So you put your chopsticks and your spoon facing 3 o'clock, and you everybody waits till everyone does this again, this together action. You all do it together. You wait till everybody's got their stuff set up. It's all lined up. Then they hit the chippy again, and you spread the bowls out. Then the servers come with the food, and it goes in your lower left bowl. Again, not the upper right or any other bowl, but it always in the lower left. And whatever food you take, you must finish. So the servers come around. It's vegetarian, and um, usually it's really delicious. And the food is served in the two bowls that are closest to you. The upper right bowl is used for hot tea. And then there's another bowl that's used with, for clean water. So basically everybody eats, and when the head Dharma teacher who's watching this whole thing mm -hmm. sees that, you know, three quarters of the people are pretty well finished, mm -hmm. um, they hit their chickpea again, and now the hot tea comes. And now you take the bowl that's dirty, you know, try to get most of the food out of it, hot tea comes, and now you use your, your hand to wash the the um the little particles that are left in the bowl from one bowl to the other, and then you drink that. Mm. Then, um, when everyone has done that, um, the clear water is then used to do a final rinse. And when these, the water, the tea is so hot that the bowls get really very clean. And then when it's done, um, there's a sort of ceremonious way that everybody stacks the bowls back up and you tie up that little placemat um, back again, and you put your chopsticks and your spoon in this little cloth container that there is, and now there's no need for this, uh, a whole bunch of dishwashing and all that stuff, because the dishes are clean. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's a really great way to eat. It's really efficient. Um, nothing gets wasted. Oh, and, and this other thing that happens at the end, which is really nice, there's always like a couple of crumbs left in the um, water at the end. So somebody comes around and you pour the clean water back into an offering bowl and then you drink the final crumbs. And that clean water is then presented as an offering to the hungry ghosts. And the hungry ghosts um, are these beings that have really big bellies and really skinny necks. So they can never be satiated. They're always hungry, but they can't get anything down that skinny neck to fill up their hungry stomach. Mm. And so when the offering of the clear water is made, that's that's to the hungry ghosts. And one way that I think it's kind of neat to think about it is that's that part of our humanity or part of our consciousness that just is never satisfied, mm. right? It's... It's craving. never going to get enough. Yeah, that craving. Um, and so they represented those sort of things as real creatures, but also I think it's, it's a state of our own mind that we can never get enough. Mm -hmm. We're definitely so sometimes hungry ghosts. Definitely. 
um, definitely oftentimes hungry posts, I think. And so that little, that offering of that gesture is paying homage to that. And so there's all these neat things that are built into all of the forms that, that have a deep, pretty significant meaning. Um, and I, I like that. I think they're, I think it's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. Now you had also, um, you edited a book, uh, The Whole World is a Single Flower, which is, uh, has some uh, commands. How do I pronounce that again? Um, come on. Come on, right. Come mm -hmm. on, come on. Uh, Koan, is, Koan is Japanese and right. Koan is um, Chinese and Korean. Right. Uh, and uh, just out of curiosity, um, well, I guess you could just speak from that, but is, is Zen Master uh, Sung San developed sort of his own uh, curriculum, is that correct? W within the uh, quantum school of Zen? Sort of unique? Um, I think so. You know, again, the thing, Adam, that I suffer from is a lack of scholarly knowledge. So okay. I'm not 100% sure what, how it's done elsewhere or how it was done historically yeah. uh, or where he even came up with all this stuff. But um, I think it is kind of his own brand for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and... Also, I was wondering if you could maybe share, uh, you talked about first your first uh, meeting with him, but um, are there any, uh, is there like one memory that stands out to you uh, involving Sung San that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, there is, and I've, I've, you know, I've said the story a million times too, so, um, but it was the first interview that I, formal Zen Koan interview that I had with him. Well, there's so many memories, but the, the overwhelming one is his, just his huge um, direction. You know, he had this, this direction that was like, I've never met anyone that had a direction like that. Maybe the Dalai Lama, you know, or someone like that, that has this, just this, every part of what they do every day is for, every, for all beings. You know, it's really rare to come across that, and he really had that. So... So my first interview, it was a 90-day, another 90-day Kilche retreat, but this time it was in the quantum school tradition. Mm -hmm. So now I'm not yet really familiar with going in to have these Cohen interviews, and you know these senior students are in there and they're making all these shouting sounds and the deep belly laughs, and I'm like literally petrified, sitting and waiting for my turn because I thought, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, and they're just going to see how stupid I am, and I'm completely mortified. And, you know, there's that Zen smugness that can people can sometimes get, that you're like, oh, they know something I don't, or whatever. So, so then it's my turn, and I go in, and I'm just really a nervous wreck. And I go in, and I bow, and I sit in front of him, and there he is. And he's got, like, the other thing about him, he's got the, these eyes. They're just so on fire all the time like there's a brightness there and um big smile and he says good morning and i said good morning you know and he said do you have a question i was completely speechless could not speak could barely like stop shaking so he said do you have a question i just shook my head no and he said no question he said i have a question for you why did you come and sit 90 days of kill chain? And I said, because I want to. <laughs> he started laughing. He's laughing, and he goes, that's a number one bad answer. But the way he said it, if you were with someone else and they were criticizing you that way, you would have a bad feeling, right? Mm -hmm. But he said it in a way that was you didn't get a bad feeling at all. You, you got this feeling of happiness, and you wanted to hear, well, what is a good answer then, you know? Mm -hmm. So he had that way of, of um, hitting you, but you didn't, you didn't feel bad about it. So it was more like kind of exciting. And he said, that's a number one bad answer, okay? You asked me the same question. So I said, okay, why did you come to 90 Days of Kilche? And he leaned in, you know, really looked close face to face, and he said, for you. Mm. And that to me was like, this is mind blowing because it was so opposite to my motivation. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 
that was that was that was my my most amazing memory. And then um, the next day, so I, I went back to my cushion. I thought, wow, that is that's wildly different. I'm there because I want to be, and he's there for me. So the next day I go in, and I'm now waiting for what I think is going to be a real call on, like some kind of what's the sound of one hand clapping, or one of these things that I had heard of. And again, he asked me, do you have a question? No, I have a question for you. What is it? Why do you come and sit 90 days with Kilche? He was always all about the why, always. Never as much about the how or the, you know, always why. That was his thing. So I, stu I stutter out. I say, F -f 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 for you, <laughs> right? And he says, wonderful, correct, that's a good answer, you know. And so you feel good about yourself for a second. You leave and you return to your seat. And then you think, well, actually, that's not true. I, mm. I didn't come here for all beings. I wish I could say that I had, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, the, that was the first two interviews. And then he went traveling and someone else led the, the 90 day retreat and he came back at the very end of it we did interviews again and I thought now he's going to ask me the real question he comes back in he goes, good morning you did 90 days that's wonderful do you have a question no I have a question for you what is it why did you sit 90 days of Jill J and that time I looked at him I said for you and that time it was a little bit more mine, you mm -hmm. know, and I think that's how he teaches. So, so it's like you grow into something. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was steering you and pointing you. Pardon me? He was steering and pointing you in a particular direction. It sounds like. Well, I think he was emphasizing, like, when you sit, when you sit for 90 days, you realize this whole you and me, I and other thing is, is non-existent. Mm -hmm. And so... To, to sit there to get something for oneself becomes irrelevant. And it's, although I, I would say we grow into it because I don't think any of us is always only for you mind. You know, I wish, I wish we could say that we were, but I know for myself, I certainly, I, I, I don't live in that place all the time. I want to, I wish I could, but, and I, that's what I aspire to, but it's not always there. And so I think though, if you have that as your direction, um, then over the course of your life, and maybe lifetime after lifetime, that becomes more and more yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good practice. And it, but you, you definitely do have to practice self-care, you know. You definitely do. You're absolutely right. It's mm -hmm. that, that's a fine balance. And I, I find, I think a lot of Zen students, myself included, we're, we are susceptible to that hair shirt mentality and being hard on ourselves and beating ourselves up a little bit because it is such a like incredible discipline there is so much that you you give up and so i think we we're hard on ourselves and we have to also learn how to you know celebrate and have fun and have joy and all that too absolutely yeah absolutely now, and you're seeing that trend is like hugely popular everywhere now like across all over the place yes you know yeah um, did uh, Zen Master Sung Son have an off switch? If he did, I never saw it, ever. Really? Like, never. And I spent a lot of time with him. He, I, I never, I never heard him complain, never once. Hmm. Which is really amazing. Like, you know, sometimes we, like, everybody's like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm going to drive over to this other town. It's late. And you can't even go talk, and these people are here, and they want to see me. I'm tired. Never once. That's amazing. Amazing. And he never was like, he was always the teacher. He wasn't your friend. Hmm. You know, he, he wasn't your buddy. Did he have, he like, was, a friend, that, uh, like, a confidant? he was really fun to hang out with. Like, he was really, um, it was always a blast to hang out with him. But in every moment, any time, all the time, he was teaching. He was like a machine. So, like, even if, I remember one time getting on an airplane with him, and we were going to Europe or somewhere. It was a long flight. Mm -hmm. And I was reading, like, you know, like a summer trashy novel. It wasn't trashy, trashy, but, you know, it was just, like, some 
novel. And I, even then he was like, watch your time. What are you doing with your time? Don't kill your time. And like anything like that. Now, again, it goes back to what you're saying about self-care and all that. And it's not a crime to read a book. Mm -hmm. But he, he was just always doing that. Mm -hmm. he, was, he would sit on the plane and do his mantra the entire time. It's amazing. He was an amazing man. Now, did he ever take, uh, he had to have, I would hope, uh, some some friends in all this, too, where he could actually take off maybe the teacher hat for a little bit. Did he ever, I mean, did he have people that he, he did have as, like, confidants and peers that were not his students? Uh, I never, I never saw that. Interesting. It's really funny. Like, even if, like, he had a lot of friends that were Korean friends that he thoroughly enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Um... Be, because, as, as I said, he's incredibly patriotic. He loves Korea, loved Korea and Korean people. And But even, like, these people were his friends and countrymen, and he had known them growing up and stuff. But when you went to their house for dinner or something, it was always like this dignitary is visiting, and they would laugh and they would joke and have fun, but it was always like in this way that they're paying homage to him and he's definitely sitting in some sort of a teacher's seat. Mm. As you can imagine, like the Dalai Lama goes somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, he, they, they treated him like that. Mm -hmm. And at least that's what I never saw him. Like we would go to the movies and go for it. When, when I lived in L.A., a bunch of us would go. We'd go to these um, Zatoichi movies and Kung Fu movies all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and he would, we really get to hang out with him in a casual way, and we go to restaurants, and he, he was a great lover of people, so we'd always go out to breakfast or lunch or Chinatown or little Tokyo, and he loved to shop, and but he was always in that role. He was never, he was fun, but he was never like, he was still teaching all the time. I can't describe it. Wow. That's my experience. I, His I mean, on switch was always on. He always. had no off switch, yeah. Um, it, describe for us uh, briefly what Sung San's Dharma was. What, what was his like essential teaching? Why do you eat every day? If I had to sum it up, that would be it. Okay. Why do you eat every day? So, so everything for him was about your direction. If your direction is clear, this moment is clear. If this moment is clear, your life is clear. Everything is clear. You know, if your direction's not clear, nothing's clear. So he was always about that. And I would imagine that the the answer is the same as why do you, why do you sit ninety days? Um, yeah, I'll let, I'll let the um, listeners come to that, each, okay. each of them on their own. But he, yeah, I mean, he would say, like, people, a lot of people would raise their hand and say, um, well, I eat because I'm hungry and I don't want to die, or um, he, I eat because I'm hungry. And he'd say, yeah, frog is hungry, snake is hungry, you know, dog is hungry, but you're a human being, so why do you eat every day? And he was, he was all about making that clear all the time. Um, how has the organization, um, you know, handled his death and, and kind of figuring out how to go on as an organization? The other amazing thing that he set up, and, and we all have our responses to forms and hierarchies, and there's a lot about that stuff that's not, like, inherent to me as a Western person that I don't really care about that much or anything like that. But sometimes when I look at it, how the organization has lived on after him, mm -hmm. I'm also amazed at his administrative astuteness and his, his vision that went beyond his own lifetime. So he tried to get a lot done in a short amount of time. So he came over here when he was, what, around 50-ish? Maybe a little young, I don't know, definitely no younger than late 40s. I think he may have been 50. You might know the answer to that better than me. Mm -hmm. But let's say he was 50. He knew he had probably 20 years to get something set up, right? Mm -hmm. So he set up all these temples, all these 
um, he has like some amazing properties and temples across the world um, in the United States, but in other countries as well. So you got that going. So the buildings would at least be there for for people to come long after you know he was gone. I think he had to, you know, give everybody um, a teaching hat as soon as he could to try to delegate and leverage out this um, dharma so that people could spread it out because one person can't do it all alone. Mm -hmm. And and again, they didn't have the internet and all these other things in those days, so, you know, he would have to physically be running around everywhere. If you wanted to hear him speak, you'd have to go to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so he set up the structure, and right from the beginning, we had, you know, boards of trustees, and he had all these layers that were based on the monastic tradition of five precepts, ten precepts, senior Dharma teacher, you know, Dharma teacher in training, uh, you know, Jita Pope's name, Zen master, and he'd make you go around and, and train and get approval from other traditions, too. And so he set up a group of, um, he got quite a few teachers that he, you know, gave Inca and transmission to before he died. And um, everybody has a difference. I think all of us all together would never add up to one of him. But, um, you know, everybody has their different strengths and weaknesses among our teachers group. But um, we, we work pretty well together in the organization. And we, we do things by group. The teachers group decides everything. We vote. Um, right now, we elected, we re-elected Zen Master Sung Yang, Bobby Rhodes, to be our head teacher. Um, we're not going to have the same kind of, quite the same top-down thing that we had before, but it's it's kind of good. So we have a teacher's group in the United States, we have a teacher's group in Europe, we have a teacher's group in Asia. As a matter of fact, they all just got back from the whole world as a single flower conference in Asia where 200 people went from all over the world. And most of the teachers, well, maybe at least half of them got to go. And we try as best we can to work together. And we have the same sort of push and pull that any other organization would have. And we have the same, you know, minor politics and skirmishes that other organizations have. Uh, we've had the same growing pains that the other traditions have had. But what we do have is um, bylaws and um, structures and processes that were well established in those 20 years when he, you know, got all that stuff set up. Those structures and bylaws will, um, I think, help the next generations to come because, you know, no one of us has that long time on Earth. So this is more the 10,000 year plan. And he, he really tried to set up these forms so they would last. So sometimes when I sit in these, you know, different long ceremonies and things, and I, I sometimes think, oh, you know, this is a lot of hoopla. Why do we have to have all this stuff? And, you know, I don't need, I don't, I don't mean to say that we even have to have it, but for whatever reason, people, those forms, like those formal meals and the bowing and the robes, it, it helps a lot of people to plug into something that that's bigger than any one of them, you know. So um, I think our organization has done pretty well. Um, one of the things that we struggle with, we're not, I think, not quite as popular as we'd like to be as far as the numbers of people who come to the retreats. And I think our forms can put off a lot of people, too. Um, so it's always that tension of, well, what do you keep? You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. What do you keep in terms of these forms? And what should we perhaps maybe over the years let go of so that it's more accessible to Western people? Mm -hmm. um, now, can individual you know, we, teachers decide to sort of do that, or, or is it more of a, you got to kind of do a decision on that organizationally? Organizationally. Okay. I mean, there's small things you could do, like, um, you know, one of the changes that someone made recently that this was sort of a big deal was on one of the breaks and the long retreats, you could do stretching and yoga mm -hmm. for half an hour. So that was like a big deal. Um, and it sounds like ridiculously small if you think about it, but if any teacher um, who becomes a Zen master in our school wants to go off and do something else completely, they can with the blessing of the school. Um, but if you want to really remain inside the tradition of the school, it's, you can't just change the forms around. And that's what makes it 
really cool for international travel. So let's say I do, um, let's say I'm a Zen student in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And now I want to go to Korea to sit a long retreat, or I want to go to Berlin, or I want to go to Warsaw, or I want to go, you know, to any city in the world. I want to go to Palma de Mallorca. I can walk into a quantum Zen school, Zen center. It's the same exact forms, the same exact everything everywhere. Mm -hmm. The only thing that changes is the Heart Sutra in English is becomes the Heart Sutra in Spanish or Russian or Polish or Hungarian or what have you. But everything else is pretty much the same. Yeah, that is... There's something really cool about that, um, I have to say. <coughs> that is a nice container. And I have to say, on the flip side, too, uh, going around and making this documentary that I am now, too, it's also nice sometimes, and it sounds like part of your... It's also nice sometimes to actually have to change things up, and it sounds like um, part of what... Correct me if I'm wrong, Sung Song, what have you do is... Uh, before transmission, you would have to go and sort of study with other teachers for a while? Yeah. Okay. To kind of get uh, acclimated with those forms as well or to see what they're doing? Yeah. You know, and um, for, for myself, I had luckily had um, a fair amount of experience before coming to our school to see other traditions. Right. But one thing I really discovered as I went around is that practice of the koan practice is not widely used. Mm. Um, and it's, it's um, I think the, the style of um, koan practice that the Master Sensong practice is really refreshing and alive, and you didn't see it in quite the same way used. So that was that was interesting to see. Yeah, I definitely have heard. Um, I remember I talked to James Ford once, and you know he's <clears throat> trained in the Harada Yasutani uh, koan curriculum. And he uh -huh. said that sometimes he would get uh, uh, quantum school students, uh, and he, he would just make the observation that it was th they were two very different traditions uh, that, yeah. that people were coming at things from. Um, it's true, yeah, they are. Yeah. Uh, so I just have one more question, and then the, the final kind of wrapping up uh, is just... Uh, kind of open mic time if you, in case we didn't cover something if, if you didn't if you have nothing to say no worry but if we didn't cover something that you might have liked to talk about um, you can do that at the end uh, but my last question is just are there any um, uh, books that you would recommend to people who are interested in getting involved with this practice yeah um, well I again I I'm not a great reader of many Buddhist texts, so my list would probably leave out some really fantastic things, so apologies to anybody out there that I might forget, but um, I always loved, a, there was a book called Radical Zen, The Sayings of Zen Master Joe Shu. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I think it's really hard to find, but I, it's just these little snippets of conversations between students and Zen Master Joju, who is one of my favorite historical characters. Um, I've always loved that. Dropping Ashes on the Buddha by Zen Master Sung San. Mm -hmm. Zen Mind Beginner's Mind by Suzuki Roshi. Um, I think Pima Children, anything by her. I haven't read all of her books, but I think she has a lot of really useful things to, to say. Swampland Flowers is another book that, that I loved. Um, let's see what else. I like poetry um, a lot, but again, I don't know if that's particularly helpful to someone starting out, but um, Zen Master EQ. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a teenager, Siddhartha by Herman Hess, was, I, that really blew my mind, so I haven't read that since that time, but um, I remember that being pretty eye-opening. It's brought people um, to practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? You know, any of the books by Zen Master Sung San, I think, are good. You know, Compass of Zen. Oh, yeah. Um, Bone of Space is a beautiful poetry book. Mm -hmm. uh, Dropping Ashes on the Buddha or any of his other books. Only Don't Don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then... Um, you know, I think a lot of it, I think there's so many out there, I, you know, there's so many good books out there, but those are some of my favorites. Yeah, those are good recommendations. Um, and also, just out of curiosity, do you have any uh, new books in the works? 
You know, I, I am kind of dabbling writing, and we'll see what it comes out um, to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I hope so. I hope to produce something. Can too. you give us a little? Um, it's, been, it's been really busy. I, I You know, I have a full-time job, and I have two young children. They're getting a little older now, so one's in middle school, and my daughter just started ninth grade this year. Mm-hmm. So that has really been um, a very, very busy demanding um, use of time. Mm-hmm. But now once in a while when they're both, like if they're both out doing something with their friends, I'm starting to uh, roll up my sleeves and do a little writing. I'll see what, ha- see what emerges. Yeah. The way I write is more, I just write whatever comes out and then mostly, you know, edit out like 99% of it. Okay. <laughs> you know, you think it's brilliant the day you write it down. You're like, oh, that, that is just absolutely astounding. And you put it down, you come back two or three weeks later, and you're like, what a bunch of drivel. That's going in the trash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, no good. Um, but I'll keep yeah, a sentence. <laughs> what? But I'll keep one or you two keep sentences. A sentence. You keep a sentence. Yeah. You keep, yeah, one thing in there is usually good. That's the, that's the nice part. There's usually some good stuff in there, and you just take that out and... <laughs> And then it kind of informs the next thing. Yeah. Well, I pre- since you are so busy, and I know that uh, I appreciate you making the time today to talk to me. Um, well, I appreciate you making the time to talk to me. I really do. Thank you so much, and for all the stuff you're doing on your website and your movie and, and everything you're doing. Um, it's big work you're doing, so thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, also, if we didn't, did we uh, cover most of the topics you wanted to? Maybe explore, or if we didn't talk about something, uh, you can go ahead and, and address. I think, you know, you, you asked really good questions that were allowed us to, I think, touch upon anything that that would be noteworthy or something good to think about, you know. I can't think of anything else that I, that I feel like I need to say. Okay. Well, then, uh, thank you very much, and you have an awesome day. You too. Thank All you, right. Adam. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.